Tuesday, Yours, 9 May 1944. Dear Kitty, I finished my story of Ellen the Fairy. I have copied it once on nice note paper. It certainly looks very attractive, but is it really enough for Daddy's birthday? I don't know. Margot and Mummy have both written poems for him. Mr. Crawler came upstairs this afternoon with the news that Mrs. B., who used to act as a demonstrator for the business, wants to eat her box lunch in the office here at two o'clock every afternoon. Think of it. No one can come upstairs any more. The potatoes cannot be delivered. Ellie can't have any lunch. We can't go to the W.C. We mustn't move, etc., etc. We thought up the wildest and most varied suggestions to wheedle her away. Von Don thought that a good laxative in her coffee would be sufficient. No, replied Coupuis. I beg of you not. Then we'd never get her off the box. Resounding laughter. Off the box, asked Mrs. Von Don. What does that mean? An explanation followed. Can I always use it? She then asked stupidly. <laughs> Imagine it, Ellie giggled. If one asked for the box and be in course, they wouldn't even understand what you mean. Oh, Kit, it's such wonderful weather. If only I could go outdoors. Yours, Anna. Wednesday, 10 May, 1944. Dear Kitty, we were sitting in the attic doing some French yesterday afternoon when I suddenly heard water pattering down behind me. I asked Pater what it could be, but he didn't even reply, simply tore up to the loft where the source of the disaster was and pushed Mushi, who, because of the wet earth box, had sat down beside it harshly back to the right place. A great din and disturbance followed, and Mushi, who had finished by that time, dashed downstairs. Mushi, seeking the convenience of something similar to his box, had chosen some wood shavings. The pool had trickled down from the loft into the attic immediately, and unfortunately landed just beside and in the barrel of potatoes. The ceiling was dripping, and as the attic floor is not free from holes either, several yellow drips came to the ceiling into the dining room, between a pile of stockings and some books, which were lying on the table. I was doubled up with laughter. It really was a scream. There was Mushi crouching under a chair, Pater with water, bleaching powder, and floor cloth, and Von Don trying to soothe everyone. The calamity was soon over, but it's a well-known fact that cats' puddles positively stink— the potatoes proved this only too clearly, and also the wood shavings that Daddy collected in a bucket to be burned. Poor Mushi, how are you to know that Pete is unobtainable? Yours, Anna. P.S. Our beloved Queen spoke to us yesterday and this evening. She is taking a holiday in order to be strong for her return to Holland. She used words like, Soon when I am back, speedy liberation, heroism, and heavy burdens. A speech by Gerbrandi followed. A clergyman concluded with a prayer to God to take care of the Jews, the people in concentration camps and prisons, and in Germany. Thursday, 11 May, 1944. Dear Kitty, I'm frightfully busy at the moment, and although it sounds mad, I haven't had time to get through my pile of work. Shall I tell you briefly what I have got to do? Well then, by tomorrow I must finish reading the first part of Galileo Galilei as it has to be returned to the library. I only started it yesterday, but I shall manage it. Next week, I have got to read Palestine at the Crossroads and the second part of Galilei. Next, I finished reading the first part of the biography of the Emperor Charles V yesterday, and it's essential that I work out all the diagrams and family trees that I have collected from it. After that, I have three pages of foreign words gathered from various books, which have all got to be recited, written down, and learned. Number four is that my film stars are all mixed up together and are simply gasping to be tidied up. However, as such a clearance would take several days, and since Professor Anna, as she's already said, is choked with work, the chaos will have to remain a chaos. Next, Theseus, Oedipus, Peleus, Orpheus, Jason, and Hercules are all awaiting their turn to be arranged, as their different deeds lie crisscross in my mind like fancy threads in a dress— it's also high time Myron and Phidias had some treatment, if they wish to remain at all coherent. Likewise, it's the same with the seven or nine years' war. I'm mixing everything up together at this rate. Yes, but what can one do with such a memory? Think how forgetful I shall be when I'm eighty. Oh, something else. The Bible. 
How long is it still going to take before I meet the bathing Susanna? And what do they mean by the guilt of Sodom and Gomorrah? Oh, there is such a terrible lot to find out and to learn. And in the meantime, I've left Lizalette of the Faults completely in the lurch. Kitty, can you see that I'm just about bursting? Now, about something else. You've known for a long time that my greatest wish is to become a journalist some day, and later on a famous writer. Whether these leanings towards greatness, or insanity, will ever materialize remains to be seen, but I certainly have the subjects in my mind. In any case, I want to publish a book entitled Het Octuis After the War. Whether I shall succeed or not, I cannot say, but my diary will be a great help. I have other ideas as well besides Het Octuis, but I will write more fully about them some other time, when they have taken a clearer form in my mind. Yours, Anna. Saturday, 13 May, 1944. Dearest Kitty, it was Daddy's birthday yesterday. Mummy and Daddy have been married 19 years. The charwoman wasn't below, and the sun shone as it has never shone before in 1944. Our horse chestnut is in full bloom, thickly covered with leaves, and much more beautiful than last year. Daddy received a biography of the life of Linnaeus from Coupuis, a book on nature from Crawler, Amsterdam by the Water from Dussel, a gigantic box from Van Don, beautifully done up and almost professionally decorated, containing three eggs, a bottle of beer, a bottle of yogurt, and a green tie. It made our pot of syrup seem rather small. My roses smelled lovely compared with Miep's and Ellie's carnations, which had no smell, but were very pretty, too. He was certainly spoiled. Fifty fancy pastries have arrived. Heavenly! Daddy himself treated us to spiced gingerbread, beer for the gentlemen, and yogurt for the ladies. Enjoyment all around. Tuesday, your 16 Anna. May, 1944. Dearest Kitty, just for a change, as we haven't talked about them for so long, I want to tell you a little discussion that went on between Mr. and Mrs. Von Don yesterday. Mrs. Von Don. The Germans are sure to have made the Atlantic Wall very strong indeed. They will certainly do all in their power to hold back the English. It's amazing how strong the Germans are. Mr. Von Don. Oh, yes, incredibly. Mrs. Von Don. Yes. Mr. Von Don. The Germans are so strong they're sure to win the war in the end, in spite of everything. Mrs. Von Don. It's quite possible. I'm not convinced of the opposite yet. Mr. Von Don. I won't bother to reply any more. Mrs. Von Don, still you always do answer me. You can't resist capping me every time. Mr. Von Don, of course not, but my replies are the bare minimum. Mrs. Von Don, but still you do reply, and you always have to be in the right. Your prophecies don't always come true by a long shot. Mr. Von Don, they have up till now. Mrs. Von Don, that's not true. The invasion was to have come last year and the Finns were to have been out of the war by now. Italy was finished in the winter, but the Russians would already have Limburg. Oh, no, I don't think much of your prophecies. Mr. Von Don standing up. It's about time you shut your mouth. One day I'll show you that I'm right. Sooner or later you'll get enough of it. I can't bear any more of your grousing. You're so infuriating, but you'll stew in your own juice some day. End of Part 1 I really couldn't help laughing. Mummy, too, while Pater sat biting his lip. Oh, those stupid grown-ups. They'd do much better to start learning themselves before they have so much to say to the younger generation. Yours, Anna. Friday, 19 May, 1944. Dear Kitty, I felt rotten yesterday, really out of sorts. Unusual for Anna, with tummy ache and every other imaginable misery. I'm much better today, feel very hungry, but I'd better not touch the kidney beans we're having today. All goes well with Pater and me. The poor boy seems to need a little love even more than I do. He blushes every evening when he gets his goodnight kiss and simply begs for another. I wonder if I'm a good substitute for Bosch. I don't mind. He is so happy now that he knows that someone loves him. After my laborious conquest, I've got the situation a bit more in hand now, but I don't think my love has cooled off. He's a darling. 
but I soon closed up my inner self from him. If he wants to force that lock again, he'll have to work a good deal harder than before. Saturday, yours, 20 um. May, 1944. Dear Kitty, Last evening I came downstairs from the attic, and as I entered the room saw at once the lovely case of carnations lying on the floor, Mummy down on hands and knees mopping up, and Margot fishing up some papers from the floor. What's happened here, I asked, full of misgivings and not even waiting for their answer, tried to sum up the damage from a distance. My whole portfolio of family trees, writing books, textbooks, everything was soaked. I nearly wept and was so worked up that I can hardly remember what I said. But Margot said that I let fly something about incalculable loss, frightful, terrible, can never be repaired, and still more. Daddy burst out laughing. Mummy and Margot joined in. But I could have cried over all the toil that was wasted and the diagrams I'd so carefully worked out. On closer inspection, the incalculable loss didn't turn out to be as bad as I'd thought. I carefully sorted out all the papers that were stuck together and separated them in the attic. After that, I hung them all up on the clotheslines to dry. It was a funny sight, and I couldn't help laughing myself. Maria de' Medici beside Charles V, William of Orange and Marie Antoinette. It's a racial outrage, was Mr. Von Don's joke on the subject. After I'd entrusted my papers into Pater's care, I went downstairs again. Which books are spoiled, I asked Margot, who was checking up on them. Algebra, she said. I hurried to her side. But unfortunately, not even the algebra book was spoiled. I wish it had fallen right in the vase. I've never loathed any book so much as that one. There are the names of at least twenty girls in the front, all previous owners. It is old, yellow, full of scribbles and improvements. If I'm ever in a really very wicked mood, I'll tear the blasted thing to pieces. Yours, Anna. Monday, 22 May, 1944. Dear Kitty, On May 20th, Daddy lost five bottles of yogurt on a bet with Mrs. Von Don. The invasion still hasn't come yet. It's no exaggeration to say that all Amsterdam, all Holland, yes, the whole west coast of Europe, right down to Spain, talks about the invasion day and night, debates about it, and makes bets on it, and hopes. The suspense is rising to a climax. By no means everyone we had regarded as good Dutch have stuck to their faith in the English. By no means everyone thinks the English bluff a masterly piece of strategy. Oh, no, the people want to see deeds at last, great heroic deeds. Nobody sees beyond his own nose. No one thinks that the English are fighting for their own land and their own people. Everyone thinks that it's their duty to save Holland, as quickly and as well as they can. What obligations have the English towards us? How have the Dutch earned the generous help that they seem so explicitly to expect? Oh, no, the Dutch will have made a big mistake. The English, in spite of all their bluff, are certainly no more to blame than all the other countries, great and small, which are not under occupation. The English really won't offer us their apologies, for even if we do reproach them for being asleep during the years when Germany was rearming, we cannot deny that all the other countries, especially those bordering Germany, also slept. We shan't get anywhere by following an ostrich policy. England and the whole world have seen that only too well now, and that is why, one by one, England, no less than the rest, no will have country to make heavy is going sacrifices. to sacrifice its men for nothing, and certainly not in the interests of another. England is not going to do that either. The invasion with liberation and freedom will come sometime, but England and America will appoint the day, not all the occupied countries put together. To our great horror and regret, we hear that the attitude of a great many people towards us Jews has changed. We hear that there is anti-Semitism now in circles that never thought of it before. This news has affected us all very, very deeply. The cause of this hatred of the Jews is understandable, even human sometimes, but not good. The Christians blame the Jews for giving secrets away to the Germans, for betraying their helpers, and for the fact that, through the Jews, a great many Christians have gone the way of so many others before them, and suffered terrible punishments and a dreadful fate. This is all true, but one must always look at these things from both sides. Would Christians behave differently in our place? The Germans have a means of making people talk. 
Can a person entirely at their mercy, whether of Jew or Christian, always remain silent? Everyone knows that is practically impossible. Why, then, should people demand the impossible of the Jews? It's being murmured in underground circles that the German Jews who immigrated to Holland and who are now in Poland may not be allowed to return here. They once had the right of asylum in Holland, but when Hitler is gone, they will have to go back to Germany again. When one hears this, one naturally wonders why we are carrying on with this long and difficult war. We always hear that we're fighting together for freedom, truth, and right. Is discord going to show itself while we were still fighting? Is the Jew once again worth less than another? Oh, it is sad, very sad that once more for the umpteenth time the old truth is confirmed. What one Christian does is his own responsibility. What one Jew does is thrown back at all Jews. Quite honestly, I can't understand that the Dutch, who are such a good, honest, upright people, should judge us like this. We, the most oppressed and unhappiest, perhaps the most pitiful of all the peoples in the whole world. I hope one thing only, and that is that this hatred of the Jews will be a passing thing, that the Dutch will show what they are after all, and that they will never totter and lose their sense of right, for anti-Semitism is unjust. And if this terrible threat should actually come true, then the pitiful little collection of Jews that remain will have to leave Holland. We too shall have to move on again with our little bundles and leave this beautiful country, which offered us such a warm welcome and which now turns its back on us. I love Holland. I, who having no native country, had hoped that it might become my fatherland, and I still hope it will. Thursday, 25 May 1944. Dear Kitty, there's something fresh every day. This morning our vegetable man was picked up for having two Jews in his house. It's a great blow to us, not only that those poor Jews are balancing on the edge of an abyss, but it's terrible for the man himself. The world has turned topsy-turvy. Respectable people are being sent off to concentration camps, prisons, and lonely cells, and the dregs that remain govern young and old, rich and poor. One person walks into the trap through the black market, a second through helping the Jews or other people who've had to go underground. Anyone who isn't a member of the NSB doesn't know what may happen to him from one day to another. This man is a great loss to us, too. The girls can't and aren't allowed to haul along our share of potatoes, so the only thing to do is to eat less. I will tell you how we shall do that. It's certainly not going to make things any pleasanter. Mummy says we shall cut out breakfast altogether, have porridge and bread for lunch, and for supper, fried potatoes and possibly once or twice per week, vegetables or lettuce, nothing more. We're going to be hungry, but anything is better than being discovered. Yours, Anna.